today. So I'm John Blumenthal. I'm one of the co-founders of Cloud Physics, um, and I head up strategy for the company. Uh, prior to Cloud Physics, uh, some of you may have known me from my days at VMware, where I was the product manager overseeing the storage stack of ESX. So many of the things you guys are quite familiar with was um, the charge of my team uh, developing storage functionality at the kernel layer. So a bunch of us left uh, with uh, people like uh, Irfan uh, Ahmad, who was one of the core architects of DRS and storage DRS, uh, Carl Waldsberger, who you probably know from the memory scheduler and other core parts of DRS uh, that he was the chief architect on. And uh, we've been off to the races since we put our platform in the marketplace, and, and I want to uh, talk to you about that. So um, we are actually a collection of more than just VMware folks. We are brought together folks from the performance engineering groups at Google and data scientists who've also worked on some of the largest back-end platforms uh, in Silicon Valley. And the idea that was our investment thesis to start that brought the likes of people like Diane Green into our company as an investor was to combine data science with the form of virtualization that we all know and love. And the idea was to apply data science in many of the ways that it was being developed and delivered in some of the large back-end systems so the same kinds of efficiencies and safety could be achieved at scale with uh, VMware customers. And we were off to the races at the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. And it took us the better part of a couple of years to get our platform um, really established and tested so it could uh, scale in a manner that um, we're now starting to experience tremendous amounts of growth. So one of the key things we're going to talk about here today that I think is very enticing for this team of people in particular is what does this data set? What does this data set mean? Not only to you individually, but also to our industry that we all work in. So um, I'll start with something to try to incite some conversation. Before us, we have two chips. Which do you think is more instrumented? One on the left. Why? Just because it's, abs it's absurd. <laughs> 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 or the reason Roger Rabbit does anything, because it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so. This slide has provoked all kinds of interesting thoughts. Anyone else want to, which one's want to see uh, which chip is more instrumented? The fine instrument. The one on the right's got more sensors in it. It does. What does the one on the left have? Any sensors? Grooves. Not at this point in time. Yeah. Ability to be so the whole, the, th the thing is actually. Watermarks. It's got watermarks. It has watermarks. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the chip on the left is actually better understood by the food processing industry then our industry actually understands how this is consumed, configured, and deployed. I, this is an ironic thing, right? Because, simple things are easier to understand. Oh, this is no simple thing. This thing has um, got incredible complexity about being able to predict how many of these things will be consumed on a hot summer day in Boise on the third shelf in Kroger's at 5 p.m. with a particular marketing scheme. You combine all of that into an analytical form, I can tell you as a food processor how many of these chips will be sold. I can tell you how many chips I have to manufacture, of what size, what scale, where I need to put them, in order to uh, really deplete the, and sell all of these chips and understand how they're actually consumed. This chip, we, no one knows. Even Intel themselves actually don't know how their chipsets are actually being consumed. Yeah, I don't think any of them would sell on that shelf on a Saturday afternoon <laughs> or 6 p.m. Uh, yeah. Same price point I might buy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 300 bucks a piece is, 300 bucks an item is pretty high price point for it, programs. It is, it is. But enough with the chips. Where does all that data go off the chip? The chip ends up actually in data lakes. I mean, here I'm talking about the potato chip. The potato chip in its construct of how it's been created, what its configuration is, how it's being consumed, where it's located, all of that data sits in an industrial data lake. And a data lake today is enabled by the same type of systems cloud physics is created on the back end. Massive scale, open source, Hadoop, MongoDB, Kafka, Spark, you, there's a lot of words here that describe what a data lake is mechanically in order to process data massively at scale and return and control a control loop back to the producer or consumer 
to tell them what is safe, what is optimal. So there is actually every <coughs> has a data lake today. The one that I was talking to you about that manages all the chip, uh, the potato chip consumption is a company out of Chicago that went public, now went private because it's such a cash cow and makes so much money. IRI really is the thing that attaches to a collection point called the checkout register. So every time you go and you buy food, it gets scanned. That data gets collected off that sensor called a cash machine and ends up on the data lake that IRI forms for everybody who actually manufactures and consumes food in the world. IMS Health, if you want to find out which hospital has the best, sorry, the less, the fewer deaths and before you want to check yourself in, IMS Health can tell you that. Equifax, same thing uh, in terms of financial services, data lake here. GE Aviation has created an amazing data lake on Pivotal. So if you guys were familiar with Cloud Foundry and the VMware days, that got spun out into a company called Pivotal that's going to be going public at some point. GE is a huge investor in that uh, platform. It is meant to design and build a massive processing plant for GE Aviation. In this case, if you have an engine that's heavily instrumented, all of the sensors on those engines spew data onto this platform in a constant real-time state. So if there's a problem in one engine, the locale, the conditions, the mechanical repair uh, history, all of that is consolidated on this platform and a cohort analysis is run on this big Hadoop cluster to find other engines with similar characteristics to then forewarn that user that, hey, if you consume it in a certain way, you're going to actually uh, be in a dangerous situation. This has actually produced a network in the aviation industry called the Aviation Safety Network. Keep that in mind. Our industry doesn't have such a safety network. You guys actually act to some degree as a safety network to forewarn people about things that you've seen that your readership benefits from. And we're going to demonstrate something along those lines when we do our little demo here. <coughs> Industrial data lakes, they all deliver these things at a scale that every industry is benefiting from today. But the problem is IT has no data lake. It's a huge irony. <coughs> We're the most instrumented industry in the world. We enable so much more of so many other things across all the other industries except ourselves. You sound surprised that the cobbler's children have no shoes. <laughs> oh, there it is. I am. So as, uh, as the son of a physician and watching that actually happen in real life, I'm, I'm, I'm painfully aware of that. But the problems are, I think, inherent in what our industry has constructed and what it deploys. And every time you deploy a new switch, every time you reconfigure a virtual network, you're creating fragmentation and silos of data that have no relationship to one another. So a change in one domain or a performance problem in one domain isn't reflected back analytically to something else and presented to you to say there's a conflict here or there is an inherent um, a bug or update uh, vulnerability that you're not, uh, you're not aware of. And so all of this, these unknowns um, and this fragmented set of data that uh, every data center contains results in uh, all types of operational problems, waste, risk, um, and inefficiencies. So what does a data lake deliver? A data lake delivers integration. So a data lake in and of itself offers the potential for integration. You have to have a platform on top of it that actually starts to pull together a model of what the data looks like. And this has never been done in our industry. I worked on uh, two projects at v uh, not only VMware, but also my previous employer, Veritas, where we attempted to do an on-premise uh, integrated story on storage management. Life was total hell for me. We ended up having to do 20 different agent uh, variations to collect data from the element managers on the storage, from the SAN switches, from the guest operating systems, from the hypervisor. <coughs> and stitching that story together on premise required a message bus. The message bus needed to be maintained and needed to stay up in order for the data to remain consistent, for the data to be meaningful. Message buses are notoriously fragile. They fall apart, they fall down. 
you get into this management crisis of whether or not you have good data or bad data. Even vRealize Operations has this problem on premise of maintaining the consistency of its data on, on premise. It's one of the biggest problems VMware faces with its management stack. The way you solve this is not to try to do it on premise. It's to pull the data, the metadata, up into a SaaS service and do it in one place at scale with a disciplined DevOps team in the way that Cloud Physics is doing it. So with that in mind, you can start to pull multiple types of data sources or even all the complexity of what the vSphere API contains and you have a shot at actually providing true integration that's consistent and you offload the economics and all of the uh, labor intensivity that goes with trying to maintain a system on premise. So the data lake um, has precedents and benefits in other industries. IT industry, we just don't have it yet. So kind of amplifying the point I'm making is that the industry we're working in right now is in the process of tectonic shifts. You guys write about it. You guys are alerting the world to it in ways that are, are, are really amazing to follow because you're on the front lines of it. Hybrid cloud, hyperconvergence. How do I move from virtualization through into containers? These are big topics. They are such big topics. They are bigger than what preceded them as tectonic shifts in the form of client server and mainframe migrations. And you guys are in the middle of helping customers and uh, end users actually understand how do I navigate these shifts? When should I make a change? What is the benefit going to be if I do make that change? And so the idea is to look at your customer in a way that other industries look at their customers. And so how do you find your customer? How do you see them? We think the customer is their data. And in many ways, when you configure a virtualized environment, the sum of all your decisions represent really kind of who the customer is and how they're going to operate. So the more you can get access to and understand their data, the, the, the greater the benefit and the greater the insight is going to be for you to actually do something for them that is provably and demonstrably effective. So using a data lake approach with our platform on it, you can start to quantitatively answer questions that escape quantification in many ways. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the things we're doing in hyperconvergence <coughs> and cloud migration in particular. How do you quantify the benefit of making such a transformative uh, move? And the people involved in this are not just the end user. You guys are end users, but you're also heavy, heavy influencers on all of the people here. And one of the things that we've seen in the last two years with cloud physics is, is a very interesting phenomenon. And this is not why we started the company, actually. And Mark Andreessen has a wonderful phrase um, when he talks about product market fit. You start to know that you're on to something when the market starts to pull the product out of you. And so what we started to see with our platform is that when we started adding other uh, personas onto our platform, other interested parties, all looking at the same set of data, what started to happen is this person, the IT end user, didn't get the product vendor SE coming in and asking five times, how many servers do you have? What are your problems? Do you know how many, I, I'm curious to know, how many times are the same questions asked of an end user when you have to come in to actually rediscover an environment that you're working on just to determine whether it's changed or even if the customer understands what they have? I mean, these are, these are core um, effectiveness questions that our platform gives all these interested parties, the ability to look at and answer um, the key questions that we all have. So the way this is starting to happen, and this is the God slide, where um, we are starting to grow out the, the IT industry's data lake. So this data lake has very interesting data in it, some of it contrarian to many of the things you guys have written about. And what we've, uh, as a former product manager, kind of assumed going into the um, advocacy of certain types of products. <laughs> this platform enables all the people participating in the IT industry the ability to communicate with each other more clearly, more effectively, more efficiently. And it will raise the industry bar to actually create a much 
more uh, optimized and safer industry, much like is happening in the aviation industry, much like it's happening in the food processing industry. So this is what's being pulled uh, from Cloud Physics, uh, this data set that's emerging from uh, what we started servicing in the form of IT end users. We now have significant partnerships in the channel, especially, with CDW, as an example, and Ingram Micro, um, storage product vendors, um, Microsoft, and others, all in tow to looking at this data in a common form to understand what is the customer's problem and what do I have in my product portfolio that I can actually sell and align with that's meaningful. So no more 20 meetings, one meeting, straight to it, using data to figure out how can I add value to you? How can I solve your problem? So, the way this is being built out, um, this is what the data look, this data lake starts to look like uh, right now. These figures are a little bit uh, dated. Um, but the data set itself is growing and compounding on a weekly basis now as more and more customers come online, especially as our relationship with the channel partners start to increase the distribution of our vApp, the observer which is the single point of collection that has to be deployed into a VMware environment. And um, it, it is a massive data set that runs on um, open source uh, platforms on the back end. And there's a tremendous amount of intellectual property that we built over the first two, two and a half years of the company's life to allow scalable access to this amount of data. So not only is it uh, accessible on an individual customer basis, uh, we're going to talk about global queries of this data set uh, that we think you guys in particular could ask some of the most incisive questions uh, of what this might contain. <laughs>